Not really sure which is cooler, the completed fixture or the bike that I'm about to make. So this video will be about the last few parts that I haven't talked about, the assembly, how it works, and I also want to talk about some of the mistakes that I made and then how I was able to work around them. So one of the big things to this system is the Deller and bearings that are used. And they make use of these wonderful little things known as spring plungers. In the drawings, you'll see the two sides of the bearings are referred to as the tension side and the reference side. So to take a step back, if you think about it, we could just make the Deller and blocks the same distance apart as the width of our rails. Then of course add a little tolerance so it can slide back and forth but that is difficult to get it right because there will always be a little bit of side to side movement unless you can get the fit perfect. And so that's where the spring plungers come in. We have one side with them and so then they keep tension on the rail and keep it pushed up against the other bearings. And of course the Deleron makes for a nice smooth sliding action. Those spring plungers are even adjustable to an extent so you can kind of tune them a little bit, make them you know, push a little bit harder or softer. And it makes for a very nice feel. The very solid adjustments that aren't too tight. And then of course we have the custom T-nuts underneath to lock it in place. And when I made these bearings, I actually made them a bit oversized and then I left the reference surface of the reference bearing unfinished. This is so after assembly onto the angle plate, I put the whole thing back onto the mill with a fairly simple setup to make the final cut and just take the last few thousandths off and make sure everything was squared up. And it is worth noting that the spring plungers used for the axle holder are a higher force than the ones used for the angle plates on the head tube and seat tube. And that's all detailed in the drawing package. So next I want to go over these slide plates and then the towers. These are both fairly straightforward it's just a milled aluminum part and then a piece of 80-20 that we cut to length, tapped the end of, and then bored this three-quarter inch hole in it to fit our head tube and seat tube cones. Now one important note is to check the width of your extrusion whenever you get it because they're specced on the website as having a 320 thousandths slot width, but mine are up around more like 325 thousandths. So once you get yours, just measure it out and then adjust them to fit because you want them to fit as tightly as you can on most of these. Now the rear axle holder is another pretty straightforward assembly. It's basically just a larger slide plate with some 3x3 three three inch extrusion on top of it for the tower. But the axle holder arm gets a little tricky, mainly just because of the V slot that we need to mill into it. It's tricky because we need to get the location, the center line of that slot, and the depth right at the same time. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you I probably did it the wrong way. Um, maybe some of the real machinists out there can leave a comment on how it should be done. But basically, I use the mill drill that we already have because it has that 90 degree tip on it. That way, I could locate the slot precisely in the same setup that I use to drill the locating holes. Then it was just a matter of getting the depth right. So once I got the slot started, I milled it one side at a time, keeping track of the center line the whole time. And then once I got near the end, I actually ended up messing up the math a little bit, and then I cut it too deep. So it's actually not that big of a problem though, and we can correct for that later on. And that's a good segue into some of the mistakes that I made, and then how I fixed them. One big goof that I made was this, the slide plate here for the rear axle holder. To summarize, when I was milling it out, I did not have the end mill tight enough in the collet. So as I was making a heavy roughing cut through, the end mill actually ended up pulling itself out of the collet just a bit and milled it way too deep. So what I did is I just milled the part, the whole surface to that same dimension, figured out what that ended up being, and then I added the difference into this tower here. So this plate was, I'm going to make up these numbers because I don't remember, let's say 100 thousandths too thin. 
So I just added a hundred thousandths to the center line of these locating pins. And then no big deal. And you can do this, you can do a similar thing for the rest of the towers if you need to. Say you mill this, you know, 10, 20 thousandths too thin or too thick or whatever. Well, just measure it out, do the math, and then adjust the height of your tower to compensate, either by when you cut it to length or you could shim it or whatever you need to do. And in fact, I basically spent a whole day just assembling everything, measuring all the parts, tuning it up where it needed to be, and just getting it basically as good as possible. Because, you know, a little bit of time spent now fixing all that stuff, you can be dead certain that the fixture is going to be as good as possible. So let's talk about the math. So, yet again, another one of the wonderful things that I like about this fixture is the mechanical simplicity of it. So, instead of having independent logical settings and a million adjustments and sliders everywhere, we have a very simple and robust system. And then we just use math to make it do whatever we want. And I really like to emphasize the point that we are not designing a bike with this fixture. We are building a bike. Our design is already sorted out and finalized before we ever come out into the shop. So when the time comes to actually build the bike, all we have to do is place the head tube, the seat tube, and the rear axle all in the right position relative to the bottom bracket. And so that's why there are only seven dimensions needed to set this fixture, and two of them are angles. So, we take the initial dimensions that are necessary to define the bike frame, we feed those into our magic calculator, and then it spits out the numbers that we need to set this fixture. But it is easier than you think. We only have to do this math once. We make a spreadsheet. Once it is done, all we have to do is feed numbers into it. From there, it does the math for us and it doesn't make any goofball errors like I do whenever I use a calculator. Now if it were up to me, I would just share this spreadsheet with you, but I want to respect PVD's wishes and leave this as an exercise to the reader, because I do agree with him that math is very important. Being even mildly proficient at it is like having a superpower in the shop. You can solve so many problems and just and do really cool things just by not being afraid of it. But I am at least going to show you how mine works with the incriminating evidence obscured. So first, we make a column of what data we have taken from our completed bike design. These are the numbers that define our bike frame. Now, in this case, I've made the numbers nonsense so you don't get too many clues here, so don't read too far into them. Now, I don't want you to get discouraged when you set up these calculations. PVD gave his recommendation of driving parameters in the drawing package that you should use to derive these seven fixture settings. But there are much simpler ways we can set this fixture if you are just getting started. Our bike is already fully defined in BikeCAD. All we need to do now is put the head tube, seat tube, and rear axle in the right locations relative to the bottom bracket. If you use some of the dimensions that BikeCAD can already give us, the calculations can be much simpler and easier to approach for someone who hasn't done math since high school. And then after that, if you feel the need, you can go back around and, you know, improve it. But the end result will be a fixture that is still set to less than a millimeter from the ideal numbers. Especially if you go into the settings in BikeCAD and change it to display more decimal places for the numbers that you grab for the input. This will reduce the rounding errors that can stack up in these calculations. It's up to you to decide how perfect it needs to be for your goals. Also, don't be afraid to set up some of the calculations separately and then chain them together, like I've done here. This way you can work out the formula for each step individually and then put them all together in the right order in a more organized way. It can get very confusing having everything put into one line with so many parentheses stacking up and order of operations errors and all that stuff along the way. This way it's easier to keep track of it all and troubleshoot each step if something goes wrong. After all, it's a spreadsheet. You don't get extra points for making it more efficient or prettier. 
Just make it easier for yourself and set it up however is going to help you the most. But once we put our bike numbers in, we also need to know where the fixture is on the table raster. If we have to move any of the modules to make super large or really small bikes, we make, the, we make those changes here. I tried to make mine as simple as possible to use for myself. All I have to do is count the number of table holes vertically and horizontally until I get to the correct pin or pivot for each module. I plug that in and then it will automatically convert the value to a millimeters and then feed it into the calculation. After that, it does the rest of the math and gives me the numbers that I need to set the fixture. These are measurements based off of the appropriate pin or pivot. So all I have to do is move the pieces to the right numbers, tighten the screws down, and then the fixture is set. These scales are also easy to calibrate after the fact, like my axle holder arm, for example. The dummy axle sits one millimeter too low in it, so I just subtracted another one millimeter from the output in the spreadsheet. You can do the same thing if you place the scales wrong or some other error like that. By doing this, you can essentially calibrate the fixture to be accurate down to less than a millimeter. Even if your hardware is slightly off, just pay attention to the parts that you're making and check them again and keep track of any errors that happen. And once you have your spreadsheet set up and working, test it out. Just plug in some numbers for a bike and then use the table raster to measure it out and make sure that it all makes sense and that everything ends up where it needs to be. Some errors are not always you know, immediately obvious. And one of the things that's still in the works at the time of this video is a good way to support the tubes. In the original Cyberdyne system, PVD used screw jacks with some V-blocks on top of it. When a better or maybe cheaper way of doing it gets designed, it will be added into the drawing package. In the meantime, I figured out this silly way of securing some of the tubes with rubber bands. It actually works really well. And for the rear triangle, I'm trying out another method based off of the way that PVD is shared for the chain stays and seat stays, using some optical breadboard to hold everything in place. For now, to mount it to the table in position, I have a good enough solution that I'll, you know, improve upon later. I already have a few ideas that I'm working on. But I think that should cover it for now. This video has gone on for long enough for today, but I may add to this series later on if any big changes come around or if I come up with anything worth sharing. Next up will be the series on this bike right here. That'll be fun. Thanks for watching.